Hi. A few days ago, Robert Breedlove posted this. These IMF scam artists are lying to you. Inflation is legal counterfeiting. Counterfeiting is criminal inflation. Now, for the purposes of the rest of this video, whenever you see or hear IMF, I want you to think Inflation Misinformation Foundation, because that's what they are in this video. They're the Inflation Misinformation Foundation. So, here we go. Hi, I'm Sandy Leff from the IMF, and throughout this series, I'm going to be answering your questions about thorny economic issues, breaking them down, and giving you straight answers without all that fancy academic speak. Let's get started. So it's all nice and fluffy at first, and they're going to be talking about those thorny economic issues. Well, there's only one economic issue they, they talk about here, and it's inflation. So they're not talking about all of the economic issues that are basically thorns in your side. There's been a lot of talk about inflation around the world, but what is it really? And why is it happening? Well, you know, uh, according to Milton Friedman, the quantity of currency, the, the money supply, he called it, times velocity uh, equals prices times GDP. If you increase the quantity of currency, you're going to increase prices. And the only thing that can change that is velocity. But we'll get a little bit uh, further into that in a moment. So, what is inflation? Inflation is a broad-based increase in the price of things. Okay, did the things change? Or did the currency change? If you double the currency supply, but the number of goods and services remain the same, over the long run, the prices are going to double to soak up that doubled currency supply. However, in the case of like uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, you uh, send everybody checks and pay them to stay at home. And what happens to those, uh, those excess dollars? They don't cause the prices to go up right away because velocity is not increasing. What's happening is it goes into savings and savings acts like a battery. So all of those excess units of currency that are being shoved into the monetary system are going into savings accounts. And when it's in a savings account, velocity is zero. That Those dollars do not circulate. And remember, it's the quantity of currency times the velocity equals prices times the quantity of goods and services. First, when I say broad-based, I really mean that. Inflation is not about the price of broccoli going up versus spinach because there's been some new diet fad that says that broccoli is better for you. Okay, she says broad-based, but she's only talking about retail goods and services and measuring a very small portion of those. She's not talking, you know, I came up years ago when I was writing my first book, back in 2006, I think. I was on the, uh, the BLS's website and uh, I was looking at all the different ways that inflation is calculated, and there are a lot of them. And I started laughing at all these stupid acronyms that they had. And then I went over to the Social Security website to see how Social Security is calculated. And, and your increases in Social Security benefits, you take the PIA and you divide it by the COLA. <laughs> and, and you get this result and rounded to the uh, lowest uh, dollar or whatever. And uh, it, it was totally insane. And I came up with something I call cup inflation, C-U-P-P. -P. It's currency units per person. You take the currency units per person, so it accounts for the expansion of the, the population, and you have to divide that into the available goods and services that people are going. But then there's this variable that uh, humans cannot control. No matter how much central planners like these want to control inflation and your life, and you'll see that everything that she says, except for one little thing in here, uh, has a government answer to it. It's going to be government controlled, government planned. And central planning is the worst of all possible worlds. Uh, it just does not allow the price discovery mechanism to function, which is what sets supply and demand in equilibrium. And if we allow that to work, we have the maximum prosperity in our lives. 
So uh, they're going to measure these uh, uh, narrow bands of where currency can go, but with cup inflation, currency units per person, you're, it's based on this one simple fact. Every dollar must go somewhere. Every unit of currency must go somewhere. And if it goes, they're not measuring if it goes into the stock market. They're not measuring if it goes into retail, uh, I mean, into uh, real estate prices. Uh, they're not measuring if it goes into savings. And savings is the battery that uh, velocity can go up and down. The number of times that a transaction is involved, that a dollar is involved in a transaction in a year, that can go up and it can go down. And when it goes down, it means that savings is going up. And when velocity goes up, that's either that they're adding a bunch to the currency supply or, or that uh, people feel better. But when they feel better, they start spending some of that savings. It, it starts to discharge like a battery into the economy and those dollars are now circulating once again. It's about the prices of vegetables rising in general and about the prices of other things rising. <laughs> Now, for consumers like you and me, it's about a broad-based increase in the prices of things that we consume. Okay, it's, uh, she's talking always about the prices, and that's not inflation. That's the symptom of inflation. Inflation is the expansion of the currency supply. So it's expanding the quantity of the currency, not expanding the quantity of prices. It isn't expanding prices. Prices go up as a result of your currency losing purchasing power because the currency supply is being diluted by the government or by the commercial banking sector. And pay for. So that includes things like groceries, gas, uh, subway passes. For businesses, it's about a broad-based increase in the prices of things that they pay for. Okay, now here is something that she does not dig deeply enough into. For businesses, this is about a broad-based broad increase in the prices of things they pay for. In other words, the business uh, receives currency for its goods or services that it is selling. That's in the bank. It loses purchasing power uh, because there's, they're diluting the currency supply. And that means that the prices of the things that they're buying goes up because each dollar purchases less. And when those prices go up, then they have to raise uh, their prices at the retail level and you end up paying more. But so do all the employees, not just of that business that produces the goods. She's going to talk about coffee in a moment. So if you've got a uh, if you're buying coffee at the store, the store sold that coffee to you. There's a supplier that sold the coffee to the store. And then there is a coffee roaster that is supplying that uh, that is supplying the coffee to the coffee supplier, and then there is the coffee grower, and uh, beyond that there are fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. There are all the inputs, and then the labor. Now, if the retail price goes up on coffee, that means that for all of the workers, for the store, the supplier, the roaster, the grower, and the supplier of all of the things that the roaster and roast that the grower has to buy, uh, if if they go up for all of those people, that means those people need to get a raise, which means that the each step in this chain has to increase their prices again, which raises the retail price, which means everybody has to get a raise, which means that the uh, every every supplier, every link in that chain of supply, they all have to raise their price again. And it's this vicious spiral that has to complete until the quantity of currency is all accounted for. It won't stop until that is done. And, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near being done yet. You're going to see these waves, these ripples. And right now we know that uh, everybody, that on, on the average, people's standard of living is going down because their wages are not keeping up with inflation. Right now you've got the United Auto Wor Workers Union strike uh, and they're demanding to get paid more, which means that either the auto companies uh, don't raise their prices and go out of business, which is probably going to happen, or uh, they increase their prices and sell fewer cars. Either way, this whole thing is a disaster and it was set in motion 
by these people that you're listening to here. So basically, take everything that they say and sort of turn it around and take a look at the other side. So that includes the computers that we work with or the electricity bill for the lights in this cafeteria. There's a second related point, which is that it's about the representative basket of things that consumers actually consume. No, uh, they're talking about like the CPI, where they pick a very narrow basket of things and they track those prices over a long period of time, instead of tracking the quantity of currency, the quantity of savings, and, and the amount of goods and services available. GDP much closer to Milton Friedman's famous formula, which I'll show you in a few minutes. On average, across the entire population. So maybe subway pass prices are going up. At least she took the population variable and, and put that in there. But that's not going to factor into countrywide inflation in a major way, unless most people in the country actually ride the subway. But it is one piece of the puzzle, and I don't think they measure subway prices uh, in the CPI. They, they either need to measure everything in the economy, economy, which is almost impossible, or they need to measure the quantity of currency and the savings and the amount of goods and services which you get from GDP. Now, the reason that we care about inflation is that it can lower people's living standards. And it does, and we know it does. Over the past, I, I think, um, four years, the uh, average income inflation adjusted has gone down by about, uh, I think, for a household, it's about $4,000. When prices rise faster than wages, people are effectively getting poorer. Yes, and eventually, everybody asks for a raise which means that the prices have to rise again to cover those raises. It's this vicious, vicious spiral that the world's central banks kicked off with these ultra-low uh, interest rates that caused real estate to boom, with uh, quantitative easing, which caused the stock market to boom, uh, and then uh, paying people to stay home during the lockdowns, which caused savings to charge up, and then once the lockdowns were lifted, it didn't matter if they stopped sending people checks. That Those savings discharged into the economy, and as the savings discharge, prices have to rise to account for all that newly circulating currency. A dollar that I have today is worth less than the dollar that I had last year. That makes me worse off. Which is absolutely true. Whose fault is that? That's why we say that inflation is the worst tax on the poor. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, it's, it's a bad tax on everybody, uh, but the, uh, you know, if, if you make a lot, you're paying like 50% income stat tax, depending on which state that you live in. Uh, it takes a while for 5% annual inflation to, to total 50%. So which is worse? Uh, you know, um, well, you'll see something about government spending in a minute. Yeah. So, why is it happening? Well, there's two big buckets of reasons. The first is when there's shortage. I want you to notice that her two big buckets uh, don't include government and banks expanding the currency supply. Shortages in supply or slowdowns in supply. So let's think about coffee production since we're here in this cafe. Let's say that there's a bad harvest or a drought which reduces the amount of coffee beans. However, everyone in the world, including myself, is still gonna have the same demand for those coffee beans. Incorrect. Uh, in a free market, the, the price, if there's a shortage uh, in supply, it means that the price will rise because you've still got a lot of people bidding on those coffee beans. But as the price goes up, some people don't bid. And when I'm talking about bidding, I'm talking about standing in line at Starbucks. You're bidding on coffee beans when you stand in line at Starbucks or you buy coffee at the grocery store. Uh, if the price goes up too high, some people will switch to tea. And that reduces the demand. So the demand does not stay the same. And that's going to nudge prices up. Or take COVID as an example. A lot of people were asked to stay home to avoid spreading the virus. 
in some cases that led to a shutdown in ports or shipping terminals. Okay, this was government mandated. It, they weren't just asked to stay home. These, the ports were closed. This was a government created problem. But if they allow uh, the, if, if, if the governments allow the free market to work, prices would go up very temporarily and inflation truly would have been transitory uh, as it causes uh, an incentive for more people to show up at the docks and unload those ships and get stuff back into the price, in, into the supply chain. Limiting supplies. Again, that nudged up prices. The other big bucket is on the demand side. So people demanding or wanting more goods and services than there are available. Sometimes economists call this an economy overheating. Or so if you want something and you want more of it, economists deem that bad and they call it overheating. Well, if you want more stuff and prices are allowed to uh, remain free uh, and interest rates and so on, uh, then what will happen is the price goes up temporarily, more people get into that business, and the people that are already in the business start producing more, which creates more employment, which creates a better economy, which means there are more people that can afford more stuff, and everybody's standard of living keeps on going up. But watch the solution that they have for uh, people wanting too much stuff. Or running hot. So what can governments do to ease it? What can governments do to ease it? They can stay, they can keep their big fat noses out of the situation. Well, first, it depends on the source of inflation. But the broad idea is that governments want to bring down price increases to a manageable and stable level, both for businesses and consumers. Let's start with the demand side. So governments, through their central banks, can decrease demand by increasing interest rates. So they can decrease your demand for goods and services. In other words, your total prosperity in your life, because your prosperity isn't how many units of currency you have. It's how you get to live, the food that you get to eat, the health care that you have access to, and the shelter that you have, the kind of car that you drive. Your prosperity is all of the goods and services, the stuff in society, not the units of currency. So their answer here is if they think an economy is overheating, if they think things are getting too good, uh, is to take some of your purchasing power away <laughs> by raising interest rates. Now, who is charging the interest rate? The counterfeiters, either government counterfeiters or commercial banks that counterfeit currency into existence with a loan that you are taking out. If the, uh, the interest on your the real estate loan goes way up, you can afford less house. So you don't get as much for your currency, your, your effort that you have put in, all those hours that you worked to try and buy a house, it now buys less because the counterfeiter is taking a larger cut of your total purchasing power. So whether you're buying a house um, and taking out a loan to do so, or if you're charging things to your credit card, higher interest rates mean higher borrowing costs. It means that the banks get to make more profit. Uh, they get a, a larger piece of your lifetime, basically. And so those costs are going to go up, and that means less money to spend on other things. Yes, so you get less, they get more. However, it also incentivizes saving. So a lot of savings accounts give you small interest payments when you put your money in the bank. Those interest payments are also going to go up. Okay, let's check how, how true this is. So uh, here I have, hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. I've got several different bank accounts. Uh, one of them is at Bank of America still. And uh, I just clicked on 
overview and savings and then rates. And so here are their rates. And it's the same for under $2,500 to over $2,500. Uh, it's 0 0.01. Well, point, th this first digit here, this is tenths of a percent. The second digit is hundredths of a percent. So it's one one hundredth of one percent. And this is current as of today. But if, you, if you're a platinum honors tier and higher, you can get four one hundredths of one percent. Oh my gosh. I mean, this probably has people beaten down their doors to get these savings accounts. Or you can go into money market funds or certificates of deposit, and you can get a lot higher rate where you're taking your currency and you're converting that into U.S. treasuries, basically, and you get a lot higher rate, but it's not the rate of inflation. It's still below inflation. So uh, what she just said about savings going up I took a snapshot of this when I was writing my book, and it's in uh, chapter uh, five, I believe, of the book. No, it's in chapter seven of the book. And uh, the, the differences are just absolutely staggering. When I was about 17, I think it was, maybe 18, uh, I had a certificate of deposit that paid 16.9% interest not one one hundredth of one percent. Uh, so uh, the interest rates in, of savings did not go up necessarily. So she is, it, it is the uh, Inflation Misinformation Foundation giving you these stats. Now on the other side, governments can also cut spending or increase taxes and the broad idea is that there's less money sloshing around to Okay, so governments can either cut spending or increase taxes. I need to ask you a question. Has, in your experience, has the government ever cut spending? In my experience, no. Have they ever increased taxes? Yes, that happens all of the time. Uh, have they ever increased their amount of deficit spending? Spending where they don't have the tax revenue to cover it. Yes, all the time, that is exactly what is happening right now, but there is always a price to be paid in the future. Spend things on. Now let's think about the supply side. And so you're going to have less currency. She's uh, mistakenly calling it money. It has to store, if, if it's money, it's got to store a value. And she's talking about inflation, meaning the purchasing power of the currency is falling. It's not storing value. It is being stolen by the counterfeiters. It's a little bit trickier, but governments can still do something. In some cases, governments might have special reserves to lessen the damage. Think strategic oil reserves. But not all countries have these. Or okay, I want to point out first that whoever is pouring this oil into this hole has terrible aim. But second, the strategic oil reserves are for emergencies such as war or such as uh, uh, the OPEC doing another boycott and, and uh, uh, freezing us out of all of that uh, extra supply. It's, it's to smooth the price in emergencies. Now they are using it to smooth the price out uh, because of some policy that they implemented that causes a shortage. Uh, it's, it's all uh, government policy and then trying to paper over it and it's very temporary. It only benefits one administration that will get to uh, uh, use up some of that reserves until it gets down to critical levels and then there will be an election and hopefully it's the next guy's problem. Or they're not large enough to have an impact. The second thing governments can do in the longer term is create an environment that incentivizes businesses to produce more. Yes! And all you have to do is get government out of the process. The only uh, role for government here is to uh, have only the absolute minimum regulations uh, possible uh, to keep businesses honest and keep them from uh, committing. You know, you have to have laws and then businesses that break those laws have to get punished. They can't get special treatment like, uh, you know, when we've, see, we've seen uh, banks commit crimes and then they get a fine 
that is uh, one-tenth or one-one-hundredth the size of the amount of profit that they made committing the crime. So what's the best strategy? Commit the crime again. <clears throat> that there is also all of the currency that goes into lobbying to have the laws tilted in favor of certain businesses and, and sectors. And so government's responsibility is to create an absolutely level playing field with fair laws for everybody where nobody gets treated uh, in a special way. And then to make sure that they're not sticking their nose in where it doesn't belong. Uh, you have laws that uh, companies uh, pay large fines for that are much larger than, than the profits that they made. And people go to jail over if they are polluting or causing cancer or doing something uh, really bad in the environment or cheating competitors or somehow creating a monopoly. Uh, monopolies are almost always created by the government. Uh, whenever you've got a monopoly, they always try to uh, increase their profits and the increased profits. If you have a level playing field, other businesses will come in and lower the cost of that uh, product or service that the, the, that one company had a monopoly on. Past tense, monopoly over with. So let's think about a competitive environment. So you want to avoid situations where you have just one or a few firms setting prices in one industry. So for example, let's say that we live in a small town and there's just one pizza place. That one pizza place could charge us whatever they wanted to, uh, to get those pizzas. And here, this is the only thing that she says during this whole thing that is, is fairly correct. She'll make another comment in a moment. But I hope that that one pizza parlor charges $100 per cheese pizza, because watch how many businesses spring up right next door that are going to charge $15 or $20. And either this pizza parlor lowers their price to compete and keep their customer base, or they go out of business, which they should if they continue charging $100 for a cheese pizza. Now, consider competing pizza places coming in. That firm is probably going to reduce its prices in order to keep its customers. Now, stepping back in The one thing that she got right. Reality, sometimes we both have too much demand and too little supply. Too much demand is always solved by prices going up, and she would call that inflation, except they're going to come back down again because supply gets increased because of the extra profit to be made in that particular business. Uh, if, if they try to solve this through manipulation of interest rates or um, uh, manipulation of the currency supply, it always ends up in creating disequilibria between supply and demand, and you create bubbles. And when those bubbles burst, it's just the free market trying to seek that equilibrium again, but uh, it always overshoots to the opposite side because they've caused the bubble to go into such an extreme area that it would not go into if the market was allowed to remain free. So it's a balancing act, and governments often use a mix of policies to help tame inflation. The only policy they need is to keep their nose out of it. So with that said, I'm gonna buy some lunch to tame my appetite. Please be sure to send all of your questions to askaneconomist at imf.org. So send your questions to askaneconomist at inflationmisinformation.org. In, I'm sorry, inflationmisinformationfoundation.org. I wanna thank you for watching. I hope you found this entertaining.